Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're back with another Frequently Asked Questions Friday. Please hit the like button and subscribe, and most importantly, leave your questions and comments below for future Frequently Asked Questions. This is where we will look and get questions for future videos. You can, of course, go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list, and you'll get a whole bunch of free goodies. There are videos, there are samples, there are all kinds of wonderful things that we will send to you for free. Okay, let's get started with a frequently asked question. What kind of equipment would I need to be a mobile recording studio? I suppose you have to find out what are you generally going to record. It's pretty similar, quite frankly, to just having a studio at your house or in a rehearsal room, some kind of small environment where you need to record live bands. I know we talked about this before. You know, you could have a kick, a snare, two overheads is four, bass guitar is five, electric guitar is six, keys and vocals is eight. That would work pretty well if you're recording the basics of the band live in your home studio, because then of course you can keep using those other eight put inputs for overdubs for additional guitars and, and keyboards or stereo miking things, miking the, your room, whatever it might be. The limitations are going to be different for live as they are for a small home studio. Because the reality is if you turn up to a live gig, again, the kick, the snare, the overheads might do, you probably want to close mic the toms more than you would in that small studio setup because there's so much potential for bleed. If I don't have a mic on the rack tom, and I don't have a mic on the floor tom, and I don't have a mic on the hi-hat, that's okay to just use my overheads, but in a nicely isolated situation, I can compress them a little bit and bring out the toms, and it actually might be quite beautiful. In a live situation, if I try to do that with my overheads, I'm probably going to bring up a whole schnizzle ton of bleed from every single instrument on the stage. So live, I could definitely get away with maybe only one snare and maybe only one kick mic. You can do all kinds of fun things with just one mic, but I'd want to definitely put a hi-hat mic up, put a rack tom, put a floor tom and two overheads. So yes, you can do the math. That's already seven mics on a drum kit. So an eight input system is not going to work. Now it might work if you're gonna only be recording folk artists with two or three members of the band, playing acoustic guitars, doing background singers. So this is really the question you should be asking yourself. What is your client base going to be? If it's going to be recording bands, I think a minimum of 16 makes sense. Now you could of course get away with an Audient ID44 and an ASP800 expansion. We talked about that in a Sweetwater video. That would give you 12 inputs and that's probably going to get away with most situations. But if you can, 16 will give you choice, will give you background singers, might give you percussion. There's always ways to compromise. We've done it many, many times. You know, if there is going to be two background singers and you don't have enough mic inputs, then you give them one mic and tell them that they both have to sing on that. It, it happens. But ultimately, 12 would probably work if you've got those seven mics on the kit. You go for eight on the bass two electric guitars, 9, 10, a lead singer, you know, 11, 12, maybe a mono keys or a background singer. Obviously, 16 inputs is going to make your life easier. I think if you put together a 16 channel input mobile rig, meaning using interfaces with mic pre's built in, if you did that, you'd cover most situations and then expand to 24 when the need arises. The best thing to do, obviously, when you're about to work with a live band is to get a stage plot, and that will tell you how many inputs you need. If you're asking me how would I do it with any kind of budget, then obviously I would love a small console. I mean, if you have money is not an object, bring a small console in, a 16 or a 24 channel console, like a small format one. You can get 16 channel consoles, which aren't very big. Lots of people make them. They're very affordable. If you call affordable, you know, a $10,000 console or above. It really comes down to budget. My first option I think would get you going, but having a small console just allows you a little bit more creativity. Having a fader driving straight to your DAW with an input gain with some EQ all on the front will work wonders. 
Most of the budget ranges we were talking about earlier are really just mic pre's. You may have Phantom on every channel, but you're not going to have basic EQ. So there's lots of choices in the console format. And small consoles are available at like 16 channels, and then you could get your DAW with the interfaces set separately, and you could also use compression, external compression on a few things that are really important to have external compression on. One of those, of course, would be a lead vocal, possibly a bass, maybe a little bit of compression on the snare top, a little bit of compression on a kick in. These are very typical things. All of those would make the results infinitely better. It's really a case of knowing your budget and then finding the best equipment to fit that budget. Most of the monitoring could be done on headphones that you trust. If you are fortunate to do a mobile recording and have a separate room to work out of, or if you can get really grandiose and have like a little van to set up in, then of course you can use speakers. And again, what's your budget? Speakers we love start at $300 a pair for the uh, LP6s. As you can see, I use Focals and Genelex, and those are six or $8,000 speakers. And there's everything in between. There's so much choice. So it really comes down to how much you can spend. And if there is enough of a demand in your city or your town or your state or your country for mobile recording, then you can spend based on how much you think you can make. I would imagine coming down to record a band live at a show, depending where you live, is a $500 to $1,000 endeavor if you're an independent producer, engineer. I've charged more, I've charged less, it really depends. When I mix it, I might charge a lot more to mix it than the basic recording. When I did Black Veil Bride's live album, we took a feed off of the front of house console, a digital feed. We came out one cable and plugged it into a laptop and took a digital feed from there. We also had the same setup on the monitor console so we could take a feed from that. And we printed that and we had two running, so one was redundant to the other. And we actually had one of them stop. One of the, one of the Pro Tools rigs stopped in the middle of the recording. So it was lucky we had two recording. So there's many ways of working. Some of the bigger bands are working all digital now, so you can just take a digital feed. But if you're going to local gigs and you're trying to establish yourself, you're probably going to be working with analog consoles, meaning you're either going to have to do stage splits or you're going to have to take outputs from the console. That really is something that you're going to have to really think about. Do you take a split from the console and then go into a mic pre on your interface? Do you take it at the stage? You'll probably want to be near the monitor desk, or if you do a, a split off the monitor desk, be there, or if you're front of house, do a split there. There are so many different things. I think that you will probably want to do some research on who your customers are going to be and how you're going to record. If there's a local venue that you could work at regularly and needs live recording, then, then speak to them and see what you need to bring in. Communicate, always communicate with the live front of house guy or girl. That front of house person will really help you. They are the best resource for you and you need to be friends with them and not combative and then they will give you as much support as you can. Many, many times when I've done live recordings, I've been there with 20 or $40 as a tip. Thank you very much for helping and you make sure that they feel good, that you're in there, you know, supporting them and not getting in their way. So if you are thinking of doing live recording, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. If you do a lot of live recording, let us know what gear you bring and, and what your experiences have been. I mean, I've done, I did Joe Strummer, I did the Ramones, I did Black Veil Brides, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, a lot of these things. I've done live recordings and live DVDs and Blu-rays and, and albums and stuff like that. So I've done a lot of those. And I'll tell you, there's no one size fits all. I went to a club, the Dragonfly, in the early 2000s and recorded five bands in one night and I took stage splits and I rented Neve 1073s and went to my DAW which I cased up and took down there and recorded everything straight off the stage with splitters going through Neves and it sounded fantastic and it mixed really easily. Um, I, that's the way I did it but that was 15 years ago. Now, I doubt if I would do that unless it was really called for. So, understand who your market's going to be and think about what the kind of rig you would need to put together. I think you probably need to put together a rig which has all of the variables. And so you could turn up to a show and be able to record everything from a light pipe 
all the way through to some nice mic pre's. If that's what you want to do for a living, then you're going to have to do it really well. So I want to say thank you to Storyblocks Audio for sponsoring this week's Fact Friday. Storyblocks Audio is a great service for when you're in need of a quick soundbite for any project. You get unlimited downloads from studio quality audio clips, loops, music tracks, and sound effects with a membership to Storyblocks Audio. All the content is royalty free, so you can use it for commercial and personal projects, such as, of course, YouTube videos. New clips are added regularly, so there's always something fresh to download. We go on there for stuff all the time for our videos, and there is a schnizzle ton of content on there. And especially things for us, because we do so much guitar orientated rock and roll, and the keys we use are very, very organic. If we needed something left of center outside of that, they have a ton of stuff that isn't in your wheelhouse. Hip hop, EDM, dance of any description, pop stuff, and they have also stuff in our genres as well, and country and, and heavy rock. The point is they cover all the bases because they realize that for us as professionals that are doing you know, video content creation, you need music and you need varied music and it has to speak to lots of different people. So I highly suggest you check out Storyblocks Audio. I always struggle with master volume i.e. all my tracks and instruments are where they need to be volume-wise on my fader port. However, on the master fader, everything is very low, meaning well below minus 3 dB. How do you deal with that? Do I have to gain stage every track or just boost the master fader with plugins and all of that? There's low and there's really low. Traditionally, signal-to-noise ratio was a big issue. And I know we've covered this many times before, but hey, let's talk about it again because it's very, very important. There used to be this thing called tape. We have a tape machine over there that all of us recorded to. And the reality was with tape is it had an inherent noise flaw. There was a hiss that just came off that tape. And of course, they brought in lots of wonderful noise reduction things like Dolby S and SR and DBX and all of these different things we use to reduce noise and some of them Dolby C, Dolby A, <laughs> you get the picture. Some of them were fairly effective, but either way, between the tape and the equipment that was being used, hiss and noise was inherent in the recording. So you had this noise floor, a volume of noise that was there. You then had to record significantly higher than that, because if you had maybe a guitar signal, for instance, or a vocal that was super low and was just slightly above that hiss and hum that was coming from the gear, once you compressed and brought that vocal up to a level where you could audibly hear it, also, so comes up that hiss, that noise floor, that hum, all of that other stuff. Traditionally, we always printed super, super hot. And many of us still do. And why do we do that? We print hot because we have all this beautiful analog equipment. Many of us have it at our fingertips or even just one really nice mic pre. And you push that, say, one really nice mic pre because the harder you hit it, it gives more girth from the transformers. It may have tubes in it and all these extra harmonics. And just in general, analog equipment, not always, but very, very often sounds better when it's being abused. I know I talked to Joe Barisi about using a 1073, and I said to him, I like a 1073 when you keep going and you find that click where it just starts to distort, and then you click it back one, and then you know that even though it's not audible distortion, it's just enough there just to be on the edge and give it a little bit of hair, a little bit of excitement. And he agreed, that's how we all think how most engineers think. They want the most they can get out of the gear. So you'll end up printing pretty hot signals. But in the digital world, that tape hiss has gone. That's not a factor anymore. So you can get away with not necessarily having to print super, super loud. Now, if this is your master fader from right down here to here and you're printing down there, that's not the smartest thing in the world to record and mix at the lowest possible levels. Everything is calibrated differently, so I'm going to speak really stupidly simple. But if you're printing maximum about three quarters or even, you know, two thirds or three quarters of where you feel like you could print before hitting clipping, that's okay. Mastering engineers will always love something 
if it's clean and it's not clipping and there's no audible digital distortion. So don't worry too much. If you're printing 3dB lower than people are telling you to print, that's okay. It's only 3dB. It's not like you're printing a level that's so quiet that by the time you bring it up, it's all noise and distortion. So it's really, really important to just think very, very clearly about this and just give yourself enough headroom to print without clipping and digital distortion and just print hot enough that it's nicely audible and not worry too much about all of these 55 million different opinions on what is the best level to print at. Because the reality is if you give a good, decent level that's clean and doesn't have all of those digital pops and clicks and distortions and everything. And a mastering engineer will be happy to take that and get it to a level where it will translate onto every medium. So just give them something good and clean and they'll be happy. What is the importance of using a linear style or natural phase EQs as opposed to just a regular EQ? Where and when do you use these? I see a lot of people debating how EQ is used. I think there is listening and then there is looking. And one of the conversations that happens a lot, and it started about four years ago when we were pretty early in our channel, there was this, a lot of videos, and I know I've talked about this a lot, but a lot of videos talking about don't high pass, don't high pass, don't high pass. And it became almost like every channel had a video on why high passing is, is bad for, for your music and how you were gonna kill the low end. And I think now, you know, we've re-educated people. We've informed them that you know, high passing super lows that just get in the way actually don't give you more bass and more low end. They actually give you less because you get tons of phase cancellation. And it just sounds like an undefined lump of mud down there. If you want a good thumping kick, an amazing low end on your bass, big fat raspy synths, you need to carve out area for those to live. If you've got five or six instruments all competing at 60 to 80 hertz, you don't get a natural thump or from the kick and you don't get a natural fullness of your bass. So high passing is really, really important. Then the next thing that came up was, well, if you use a high pass on multiple elements of an, of an instrument, you're gonna get phase problems. And people started showing photos of our high pass and going, look, the, you know, the waveform is distorted slightly. And look, when you high pass these elements, they're all slightly distorting. And there was a lot of looking going on, as there tends to be since the wonderful world of DAWs. And there is so many wonderful attributes for being able to look at things, for being able to identify your transients. When I'm editing really, really heavy rock guitars, which is just a big blob of distortion, I praise the Lord that I printed a DI and I can see the attack point on this big, long, sustained mounts of chords. and like. There it is. So trust me, I love being able to look when we need it. To be able to see a phrase and find the perfect place to cut a vocal and strip in another piece of the vocal for a comp, beautiful. That was a pain in the butt in tape. It's all drip, 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 drip. Oh, that's a transient, I think. Oh, okay, cut it there. Oh, made a mistake. It's not much fun. We used to make duplicate copies of tape before we would edit them, just in case you messed it up, so you'd only mess up the dupe. We did all kinds of things, so we were terrified of editing. Now, of course, DAWs are wonderful. However, always looking at things is going to hinder you, and there is something quite beautiful about a wrongness. When I go to a console, especially, you know, something like the SSL, we'll boost and cut at the same frequency. What? Yeah, maybe we'll go to the bottom end of a guitar and find about 120 is super rich. And we'll boost it. So it's like, wow, this big lump of low end to get this guitar to be super, super fat. Then I'll go to the high pass filter and go to about, you guessed it, 120. And what it does is it creates this really, really sharp shelf and creates that really big thumping low end that becomes like, a beautiful place to sit the low end of my bass at like 80 and 100. Suddenly can fit beautifully in there. Now, if I was to print the before and after of the EQ, which I have done, that wave file looks all kinds of, it looks 
all kinds of phasey and weird. But what does it sound like? It sounds freaking awesome. And Reed Shippen, when we were in Nashville a couple of years ago, talked about this because somebody asked him about phase issues with using EQs. And he said, there was always phase issues with using EQs, but what was the sound like? We weren't able to be able to look at things before. I'm waffling on for so long about this because linear EQs have a place. They have an incredible place. And also the reason why many of us like Passive EQs like Poltex is because there's less phase issues. Why do mastering engineers use linear EQs? Why do they like passive EQs? Because of this very reason. If you're only dealing with two tracks, or you're working on the stereo bus, which of course is two tracks, that's where linear EQs are worth their weight in gold. And if you want to put them on buses, dr overall drum buses, again, makes sense. Overall you know, vocal buses, all of those things are really beautiful. But be obviously aware that the amount of CPU they use will be absolutely enormous. There's a lot of calculations going on to get something that does not mess with the phase at all. However, it's worth it to a mastering engineer because it will preserve the integrity and the sound of the track. So that is where I see the use for linear EQs on, in busing, on master bus, in mastering, in selections of stuff where you really want super, super detail, not in all of the hundred elements leading up to that. Maybe if you want, but the honest reality is, is like you won't hear the effects of it in individual elements as much as you'll hear it on an overall bus. Bearing in mind that because of the amount of CPU they will use, you want to be strategic of where you use it. So thank you ever so much. That was a wonderful Frequently Asked Questions Friday. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. This is where we scour for more questions to be asked. Um, and I will tr endeavor and try my best to answer as many as I can when they come up. Thank you so much. Please go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list, get the free gifts, and uh, have a marvelous time recording and mixing.